you know, it's time to reflect on, you know, all the sacrifice, all the goodness of what naval aviation has done for this nation, way beyond 100 years now. And, you know, some of the ultimate sacrifices. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Vincent Aiello, and joining me in studio today is retired U.S. Navy Captain Tom Trotter. Trotz, welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. Great to be here. Jello. <laughs> Great to have you. Well, so let's see. Our first foray into video was episode 155 with Bones. Yep. And then lo and behold, I have a chat from him and some number I didn't recognize, which was you. So apparently you two guys know each other and here you are. We know each other. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe we should get to that later. But uh, now everyone seemed to enjoy the Bones episode and he's kind enough to supply us with this studio at his FBO at Gillespie Field. And He's not bad for an Air Force guy. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Fantastic. Cool. Well, I am really looking forward to this discussion today because I think we Me can too. talk about the F-14, we can talk about the Hornet, we can talk about Top Gun, we can talk about being an Air Wing commander and whatever else comes to mind. So cool. uh, these are all experiences you've had, yeah? Love it. Cool. All right. Well, let's start at the beginning. Where are you from? Where'd you go to school? What'd you do in the Navy? And if you want to talk about what you're doing now a little bit, that's fine too. Okay. Let's start with Pueblo, Colorado. Okay. Okay. Pueblo, Colorado is kind of in the prairies. It's not up in the mountains where the ski areas. But close. It's close. It's got a very nice climate, but it's a long ways through the mountains. So I grew up in Pueblo. Two things happened in Pueblo that were motivators. There was one called the CF&I. It was the second largest steel mill in the entire nation, owned by the Rockefellers at one time. And the other thing that happened there that always was fascinating to me was we had no computers, no simulators, united, trained in Pueblo. So they did a GCA box pattern around the airfield with 707s, 727s, DC-8s all day and all night. And the city of Pueblo would get a few bucks for every time they touched down. So I knew that I probably didn't want to become a steel worker. And I love flying. I would tell my dad, I need to go out there and watch the airplanes. So I grew up in Pueblo, went to high school. We we're lower middle income, kind of. And my parents said to me real early on, you got two choices. You're either going to learn a trade out of high school mm -hmm. or you're going to get a scholarship and you go to the military. So my brother was three years ahead of me. He ends up getting appointed in the Naval Academy. He was a really smart guy, submarine or nuclear power. All right. Me, I was probably chasing girls a little bit too much, <laughs> skiing a lot, having yeah, fun. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, I, was, I want to go to the Naval Academy the worst way. The Naval Academy looked at my SATs and they go, no way. <laughs> I have <laughs> so, a similar letter. <laughs> so then all of a sudden I was an alternate to the University of Colorado ROTC. I yeah. said, what's that? And uh, my brother had these, these little Polaroid pictures of airplanes. And I go, the Navy, the Navy owns airplanes? The Air Force Academy was close by in Colorado Springs. I, said, yeah. I thought there was only guys with airplanes. No, they got these airplanes. I got to fly in a, this little jet called the TA-4. Oh, man, I got to do that. So lo and behold, I made it off of the alternate list and became a choice for the University of Colorado. That's where I went. All right. So four years at the University of Colorado, ROTC, boom, come out of there. A month later, I'm in flight school. No sitting around and waiting. Dang. They go, hey, orders, graduate in May, jump into flight school. One year later, I've got my wings. Uh -huh. Now, now I, I get finished with flight school, did okay. And they go, what do you want to fly in which coast? So I go, I want the Tomcat. I had a poster. And we all envy the Tomcat. <laughs> so number one guy got his choice. I was fortunate enough. And I'll tell you why. Because I was very average. I barely got out of T2s. But I had an instructor that was a fighter pilot. Uh, Eric Van, Vander Cleef or something like that. Okay. Okay. So this dude was Vietnam fighter pilot. Taught me everything. He was amazing. Exactly what to do in the A4. I was just, he goes, we're going to kick ass. You're going to be better than all these other guys. No problem. <laughs> I'm going to show you exactly what to do on approaches, this and that. Okay. And I was, you know, I was right at the top of my class the whole way through. You know, I was very fortunate. I credit him. And so uh, I got Tomcats, went to the East Coast because that's where my wife was from, Virginia Beach. So I said, off we go to Virginia Beach. Doesn't matter to me. I like the airplane. Did a fleet tour. Uh, as I showed up my first squadron as an ensign. 
in the wow. F-14, which is, and then about three or four months later, I became a JG. And uh, of course, uh, then you get assigned a senior guy. Then I'm in Tomcats for a tour. Iranian hostage thing happens. We get there a little late. Nimitz is involved. We're kind of involved, but not really, uh, on Eisenhower. After that, I get assigned to the FRS. So now I'm an instructor in Tomcats. There was an opportunity to go into F-18s. I raised my hand as an LSO, landing okay. signal officer, mm -hmm. and fighter guy. So they seated the first two squadrons. And I'll give a plug for Tony Kiggin. Sarge came from the West Coast. Myself, I came from the East Coast. So they put us into the two, first two Hornet squadrons, VFA-113 and VFA-25. They were all A-7 guys, marched across the street, boom, started getting our training. Went through that as lieutenant. And then, so I was in the first first Hornet squadron, first deployment of the F-18. Hmm. So that was great. Went on, do my department head tour of VFA-25, highly successful squadron, probably the best squadron I was ever in as a department head. Got command of an F-18 squadron, the VFA-151 Vigilantes. Was fortunate enough with a follow-on tour to Top Gun, which we're going to discuss a bit. Oh, yeah. So as a Hornet guy, uh, went to Top Gun at Miramar, 94 to 96. You know, so it was lovely. It was I was the last. I was the 20th commanding officer at Top Gun and the last guy at Miramar. I went up to Fallon, put the shovel in the ground, turned over the dirt for the hangar. Off they went. That's where you resided. Dog Thompson took over from me later on and moved Top Gun up there. I followed that with a uh, skiing tour at U.S. Space Command NORAD in Colorado Springs. <laughs> I was wondering about Check that, but I get it now. Okay. So I'm purple and yeah, yeah. very eligible for Major Command. And skiing. Never did a tour like of the it. Pentagon. Got, uh, got a carrier air wing at Lemoore when they had moved all the CAGs up from San Diego. Mm -hmm. So... I was at uh, deputy and then CAG at Lemoore of CAG 2. So right. we were on Constellation. I started out on a new carrier. I did nothing but go backwards with old carriers. Now, the beauty of that was you get to go into port and Instead of sitting fossil off with fuel. So boats, yeah. my other little claim to fame, if there is one, I have more landings on Connie than anybody. Probably almost 800. Wow. So On one ship? One ship. Wow. I did four tours on the same boat. Dang. Love Connie. So anyhow, uh, then I retired in 2000, jumped over the civil side. Uh, it was actually a Top Gun connection that I got another naval aviator, a guy named Shifty Pierce. He got a job as a chief pilot. He kind of held a position for me for a few years later. And then I went in and I was uh, with him on a Learjet. We traveled the world, had a lot of fun for about five years. And I've kind of been in and out of what you'd call the GA side, business GA side of private jets. Uh, I always call it, sometimes you're serving the rich and not very famous, and sometimes it's the rich and famous. And <laughs> support that lifestyle, which is very well, very good. Okay. So I've been kind of doing that since. So I've been nice. flying since I was 19 years old. Jello, that's almost 50 years. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and so, how, how many uh, hours in all that time? Oh, I hate to say it. Uh, I, well, this is what I'm proud of. 5,000 in the Navy plus, 5,000 plus, 1,278 carrier landings. Wow. Okay. Total, about 17,000, couple hundred airplanes. I flew some helicopters, too. I flew the H-60, <laughs> which I was very proud of. Yeah. That uh, I got called, you know, I did my small deck landing. Yeah, yeah. Always with another lieutenant. <laughs> but uh, I had, this t brings me to say, I had three goals in the Navy. Okay. Lofty goals. I wanted to be an O3. Okay. <laughs> That's a lieutenant. Because lieutenants are cool. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. I needed one of those belt buckles that all the Vietnam guys had from the Philippines. So they'd take a bomb, they cut it up, they hammer out your wings, and then you can put whatever you want it on it. Mine said, F and A, we bad. So <laughs> and then your so you then your name this, is like, underneath. Your khakis or something? Yeah, it's a khaki yeah, belt yeah. buckle they okay. sold in the Philippines. I go, like, okay, I need to be a lieutenant, two, that yeah. and in a fighter squadron. And I achieved all well, that. Check. So there you go. But still stuck around 20 some odd years and yeah, all those I did. hours. Yeah, I did. a and... big choice in wow. about 10 years that uh, most guys face. And okay. uh, I had a yeah. four year commitment. I was done real early wow. on. Wow, really? Yeah, that four. was it. So. Yeah. Well, you don't seem to be uh, shy of a microphone or a camera, so you must have some experience doing <laughs> this kind of thing too, yeah? Didn't you tell me- A couple times. <laughs> yeah, so aren't you on the news once in a while? And I yeah, think Gucci had Fox that. News got my, uh, even the Chinese got my phone number somehow. And I, 
it was a weird one about COVID. So uh, okay. that was an aside, but I was on Fox twice. One was for why can't we put a no, no fly zone up over the Ukraine? Oh, uh, yes, of course. Okay. And I actually had an F-22 guy that agreed with my whole philosophical approach to it. So okay. I thought that was good. Yeah. Uh, the other one was on Top Gun 2 oh. with Stuart Varney. So Stuart and I did both of those. Okay. Yeah. All right. So. And what about Gucci? You were on his show. I, I, I was need to on, get smart on that show. I'm not really Yeah, familiar. Gucci's got a great show. He's got a, a podcast. But he is in the speaker's world, big speak. Gucci's a superstar. The guy knocks it out of the Former park. Former Blue Angel. Former Blue Angel yeah. lead solo. All right. Okay. So, and then uh, a guy that, you know, I knew from Lemoore, Navy F-18 F- guy from Lemoore. He went to Stanford, got his business degree, but he's really great. His podcast is wonderful, and uh, he does a super job if anybody ever goes. He, he'll bring in 3,000 people to come to see him. Major League Baseball, NASCAR, you name it. The, you know, the PGA. Cool. Everybody All wants right. to hear Gucci's approach to leadership and the dynamics of teamwork. Well, we will have to find your episode. We can link to it because I believe in uh, sharing the wealth as far as yeah, if he's yeah. got good stuff with you. And you need to be on his podcast. Well, I can't, you know, you, you can talk can to him. I can set that up. Yeah, that's I'll right. call Gucci. Have Don't your worry. people talk to his yeah, people. My guys talk to you guys. And they can talk to me because I have, well, I have people. But anyway, uh, all right. So we want to talk about Top Gun. But first, I mean, we have to. Yeah. Tomcat <laughs> Hornet. You have, if I read your bio correctly, a thousand hours or more in each and so everybody loves the Tomcat. I want to be the first guy, but I wasn't. You, uh, well, there was nobody a, ever There's remembers. always a guy that beats yeah, you, you yeah. know. But, I mean, come on. Um, I assume you flew the A's because that was probably a while back as well, far as the yeah, it's, Tomcats. The A model, yeah, my Tomcat time. So let's just sandwich the career. Okay. Five years, Tomcats, all have 14 A's. Yeah. Okay. Then it was like, which lot are you flying? You know, so there were differences in, in Tomcats. Never bomb dropping, though. Purely fighter. Okay. Then the next 17 years were in the F-18. Then the end of my career, I was a Tomcat and Hornet guy as you a came keg. back to it? Wow. Yeah, I was day-night qualified in the F-14D, the Super Tomcat, oh and gosh. the Hornet. Oh and gosh. you know what? Most of my combat time, and I'll, I'll honestly tell you, you're going to be in combat and they're shooting at you. Boy, it's be good to be in a combat in an F-14 to go fast, and the other dude is head down running the laser. And it's like, so most of my bomb dropping, I'd go, ah, put me in a Tomcat, please. <laughs> so well, when you're the air wing commander, you can- Yeah, you should uh, get your choice. Yeah, you can get your choice. But just as far as going out, flying around, maybe BFM, but maybe just goofing, yeah. chasing clouds, I don't know, compare the two or maybe contrast the two. Yeah, I'll give uh, you a- you know, there's, what do we say in the Top Gun business? Goods and others? That's right. That's right. <laughs> okay. The Hornet. I always, here's what I would tell guys about the difference between the two platforms. When I was flying F-14As, I'd call it a coin toss. Were you going to launch or were you going <laughs> down? We spared every single mission. Uh-huh. If there were two planes, two and a spare. So you'd always go through a brief. There was a good chance you were going to go flying. Okay? If you were the spare. If you were the spare yeah. and Tomcat. F-18, we didn't spare. Our first squadrons were like, we were 98%. They were brand new. Fully mission capable, brand new. Yeah. They, But they were reliable too. Mm. The Tomcat had reliability problems, quite frankly. So I call one an analog platform, one a digital platform, and you know which one's which. Now, the D was more reliable, but you know it was probably better than our A models. Uh, strengths, Tomcat, particularly the D. And I always, people say, how fast does it go? And I said, I did this one time. I got level at 10,000 feet. I slowed up to about 150, you know, so flaps kind of come down. Uh, uh. So I'm level, plug in the blowers. I want you to make a guess. 150 to 610. What amount of time would that take? 30 seconds. 9.7. So it was, now, it didn't have any tanks on it, ah. but it was an amazingly fast airplane. And so, uh, you know, I do have one little story as JOs, but I'll, I'll tell you later is how fast <laughs> did I ever go? People always ask that question. Yeah. I go, oh, okay. I'll did you repeat straight. the test though? Sorry to interrupt. In the Hornet? Because I'm I, guessing... You know what? I never did because it's like, you know, it was just not that as fast. <laughs> right. So when an F-18 and, you know, we're I was the CO at Top Gun when we had F-16Ns, a really fast airplane with the F-110 engine, 27,000 pounds of thrust. When they met a Hornet head on, 
and a guy decided he was going to try to leave in an F-18 with single center line, you're in trouble. Not happening. Because that F-16 would go up to 800 indicated. And so they chase you down. And they, all the instructors go, it's like a little dog. Whoop, 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 whoop. And they, you just turn around and go, uh-oh, I got to turn back into this guy because they just eat you up. They'd have 240 yeah. overtake from behind you. So you had to turn and fight. That was all there was to it. Right. So, so when you compare the two, acceleration, uh, top end speeds, the Hornet was good at taking uh, and speed and using it with altitude, and it was pretty efficient up high. But we're always limited with, you know, we're carrying 15,000 double bubble mm-hmm. in a in a standard uh, F-18C model. So it was, you know, but it was very reliable. And it was way easier to land on the boat. Let's say that. Compare those two. Yeah. As an ensign or a lieutenant JG, I'll tell you what, that the Tomcat's a handful of airplane to land on the boat. The D was just about as hard. It had some different cues and... A little better HUD and, you know, an auto throttle. And the th- auto throttles were always horrible in the Tomcats. The auto throttle in the Hornet was, I called it, the primary method of landing. I told my maintenance guys, if the auto throttle's not up, that airplane's <laughs> down. And they go, oh, they'll be up if, you know, the skipper says that. So, yeah, yeah. so we, we uh, you know, you know, the primary sure. land, way of landing is, you know, auto throttles. Uh, it was for me Anybody later, that yeah. would land manually. All right, so, so go both ahead. are on the line. You're going to take one, let's say, to an air show. Which yeah. one are you going to jump in? Well, what's your purpose? You know, uh, park, <laughs> park and meet people. Uh, Tomcat was always fun if it All was right. if it was slicked down. Yeah, the, yeah. The, they, here's a little aside. The tanks were never made for combat and all that. Those were called ferry tanks. And then once they started putting them on, they go, oh, we can get longer cycles. Uh, so it was kind of controversial at the beginning. As to Tomcats normally flew with no tanks. In, in when VF one and two, 14 and 32, all those new squat, new Tomcat squadrons, they didn't fly with tanks for a long time. And then it was like, uh oh, now we go out for an hour and 45 cycle, the tanks are on. And the airplane didn't maneuver all that well with those tanks. A lot of drag plus the Phoenix rails were draggy. So, yeah. yeah. If I was to fight though, one on one, if a guy was really good, like Dale Snodgrass, you know, he would give anybody a hard time, in particular if it was a B model, you know, with the bigger engines or mm-hmm. a D. I think a Tomcat can give any Hornet a run. Uh, but, you know, the Hornet's way better in the phone booth, as you and I know. The slow fight, oh, yeah. gun at a guy, going to high angle of attack. The F- and the other part of the F-14 is this. I, want, I, want you, I wanted to discuss these two aspects. Number one, if it was a B or a D, later in the, the time frame, the airplane was blowing up. Okay, I don't know if you ever what knew you that. Blown up, the engine would come apart. Really? So, you oh, know, hold on. The A was always notorious for stalls. Being, stalling. Yeah. So it stalled, but it didn't blow up on you. Okay. <laughs> Never heard this. Oh yeah, we've <clears throat> lost several Tomcats, and until a crew from I think it was uh, the Discovery Channel was on one of the ships. Oh yeah, yeah. The F thirty one. They had a high power camera. They zoomed in. And they could see exactly because no one knew why was it coming apart. And, you know, I will say this, that the guy that was lost was one of my fellow commanding officers when we were COs together, Scooter Lamoureux, Scotty. His dad was an F-8 pilot. You know, rest in peace. He was the nicest guy. He was in the backseat when that thing blew up. And his wife still lives here in San Diego. It, and there so, was film of that from Discovery? Because I'm thinking film. of one, I think I've seen it, where I'm pretty it does certain it was that one flyby. because okay. they came by and it was and it was on a flyby, high dynamic, high Q as we mm. call it, maybe 1.2 or something, thing came apart. Oh, wow. And just instantly both of them gone. But I believe there were two that that happened to. I don't know if the other one was a B or not, but it was a 110 engine, mm. and it was some sort of a liner that was in it, and they go, oh, this is why. It's not a containment of the compressor blades and all that. But, you know, I think I've got most of that accurate. Yeah, well, so, this is dangerous business, so you have it to is. assume some level so, of risk. You know, uh, so there's some big differences. So you, you had that, and then you always had the aspect of, if you pushed it too far, that thing would get in a spin. And if it got in a spin, there's somebody that, you know, alluded to the fact they don't know if it was really post all gyration or they actually got it out of a spin. But I, it was one of my students that was in the FRS, and he later was a Top Gun instructor, but I think he got into a spin and he actually got it out of a spin. So uh, wow. pretty certain that he got it out. But as far as all the other guys, there were a lot of ejections in flat spins. Yeah. 
And the movie, the first movie, when Goose hits the canopy, that was accurate. That's right. Because Snakes you had to, about that on the part show. of the procedure yeah. of ejecting was to blow the canopy, mm -hmm. look up, is it still there in the dead air above you? Then you eject. Boy, that so, assumes a lot of wherewithal in the moment. It does. And so th here's the point. How good do you feel about taking that thing? We used to take it to zero airspeed all the time. Then it became a prohibitive maneuver because somebody went into a spin. Because if you did it right, you came straight back down, and then all that air would go up, and the engine would stall. So they go, oh, don't do it. We all love doing it. You'd watch the yawstring go the opposite way. You know, it was yawstring on the nose, which yeah, is funny. Yeah, you see that in Final Countdown, whenever they're yeah, showing the... Uh, the yawstring. Yeah. It'd that be a piece of parachute cord. <laughs> So you, that's how you took the yaw out. Yeah, because if it was off to the side, yeah, you, you, go, you had you, some side got, slip. Yeah, side slip. So we'd come back down, but then they go, uh, somebody just went in a spin and had to eject from that. No more zero airspeed tail slides. Because so you didn't know if the airplane was coming over here or going over there. Isn't that part of the fun? It was fun. Yeah, you don't know. <laughs> if you did just right, you went about 10,000 feet backwards downhill <laughs> so it's like oh the f-22 can do that now but it can come i know out just i know but yeah. it comes out good <laughs> yeah exactly. it does a 250 foot loop too whole you know? difference. Yeah, yeah true whole different story all right so yeah again everyone loves the tomcat i never flew oh, yeah. it but i i had a chance to the turkus the turkosaurus oh absolutely it's it was a handful of air we had a whole podcast about it a whole yeah. series of and, the, and the roll so. roll was sloppy because it was yeah. rolling with differential tail and spoilers and right? spoilers yeah you know, yeah. Spoilers are bad. Way to roll like that. Yeah, we oh, talked yeah. about that oh, yeah. in our episodes too. Built tough. All right, let's talk about Top Gun. And first yeah. thing I want to ask you is, hold on. You, the first time you mentioned it in your bio just now is when you showed up to be the CO. But yeah. had you had you attended? Before well, you that? had. You had to have. Well, There's the I prerequisite. Mean, I'm talking to the yeah, folks. Yeah, but do here. I have wings? Yes. <laughs> okay. Had I gone through the class? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So let's <clears> give you. Let me give you a little parallel story here. Please. I go through, but I didn't go through in the Tomcat. So I went through with the first. Uh, first F-18s from the fleet. Now, VX-4 had gone through with F-18s to contest. On, right? yeah. But I was paired up. So you know, this this is this was kind of fun. I went through as an experienced Tomcat guy in the F-18. Because when I got to my first squadron, 113, they go, hey, have you gone to Top Gun? I said, no. Well, you're the fighter training guy. That You're going right now. So I went down there. I got paired up with a VX-4 Tomcat. So they go, we want a mixed, ah, we section. want a mixed section. Mm -hmm. We want to see how it works. And so yeah, it was a great guy I went through with. And, uh, you know, <laughs> the great part was <laughs> that uh, Randy Cunningham always tells a story of, he goes, I come by, I'm over the top. I see, I see this Tomcat down there. And, and Cunningham rolls in in this A4 behind us, you know, MIG, our, our MIG killer, our ace. Yeah, yeah. And so Duke rolls in behind him because he didn't see me. And so right as he's rolling in behind my flight lead, my, my Tomcat, my section, I shoot him. And it's like, where'd he come from? He always gave me a hard time at the bar about that when I was. The Tomcat was like your decoy. He was like my decoy. Yeah. The aluminum overcast. Yeah, yeah. You know? All right. So you went through in the Hornet. And the this Hornet. was what 1985. Two years ah. before the movie. Okay. Yeah. So, so I was a lieutenant. Yep. Tom Cruise is a lieutenant. Life, Pete Mitchell. Life Off was go. good. There we life go. Was good. Yeah. So the movie viewers should be aware. Uh, our character Pete Mitchell, you know, Cougar has his issue, so he, Maverick gets to go with Goose, and ostensibly the story takes place while he's at Top Gun, and then of course there's this thing in the Indian Ocean. He's got to go back. But was that how it was back then? Was is that is that based on some truth? You know, I've been asked that I can't tell you countless times. But here's here's the difference. The people say, what's the difference between two movies? I said, the first movie is a lot of contrived cinematography. Now, I'll, I'll give you an example. When the F-14 gets into its flat spin, do you know where that was done? I think they just had camera angles. They, that they it was around, on right? the pier at Alameda on a crane. And then they poured lighter fluid on it. It was about a six-foot model, and then it went into a spin as they released it. Mm. So a lot of this stuff is just... You know, the upside down above each other. So it's a lot of yeah. cinematography, the stuff they run around Yuma low, but, the, you know, turn on the dump mask. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, stuff. So none of it's like the second movie. I always tell people that's pretty much all real except for the contrived airplane at the beginning. Well, and the super close stuff they do. Yeah, well. super close yeah. is not quite. Yeah. Going, splitting the section. Yeah. So the, the first movie. Uh, you know, there's not a Top Gun trophy. Is there kind of was, but there kind of is not. You, we know. I'll tell you. That's another story. But uh, there's no trophy. You don't hang around the pool and do that. You know, it's a whole different graduation ceremony. The students aren't off at the beach all night. You know, they were. They're all studying their rears off. So there's none of the frivolity 
Yeah. But it won't be a fun movie if it's not. What, I, what I'm trying to lead you towards here. Go ahead. Give me the me, answer. <laughs> is power projection. So, oh, there was a course that was only five weeks long. Not six, five weeks. Okay. And you know what? If they sent you, you passed. You know, it was sort of like you fog a mirror, off you go. And uh, you got your patch and uh, you got, you know, your critique of how you did. And the course was over after five weeks. You know, the idea was to train a training officer for the squadron. From their not, first tour. From their first, it may be at the end of their, near the right. midway of their first tour. They've gone on a cruise. They're experienced. No one had a thousand hours that would go down through that class. But they were like good pilots, solid guys, good officers. And it was like, okay, that was the incentive. So it was the commanding officer's choice. He sent them down. Totally changed around. By the time I got there as the CO, all the criteria had changed. And they're really trying to build the weapon schools. And this Top Gun staff would come out of that too. So uh, when, when 1994 through 96, it changed over to SFTI, Strike Fighter Tactics Instructor, that were part of the Strike Fighter Weapons Training Plan. And I can go into, there's probably a little bit of unknown that wasn't even in uh, Brad's book, but the beyond that, the, the, the gentleman that really embraced it, that really got it going and accelerated, was a guy named Jerry Singleton. Hook was his call sign. He was our Commodore. Mm -hmm. And so he said, hey, Trotz, we need to go down to this Sinatra symposium. I go, well, what's Top Gun doing at Sinatra? He goes, I have a plan. And what we're going to do is we're going to build a continuum that's the SFWT, because SFWT is the way of the future. And we went down there and we pitched the SFTI program along with SFWT, this whole Top Gun transition. The TRACOM embraced it. They go, we're putting $110 million towards this program. No one ever knew that. And so they went to the CNO. They went to, you know, how we had all those codes in this and that and the other. And they go, that program's awesome. Everybody needs it. And so because of Jerry Singleton's vision, that program was instituted for the E2s, the S, all the S3s. Yeah. Everybody had it. And so everybody went, wait, we need, and he called it, you know, <laughs> cradle to grave. I don't know about the grave part. But what it really was was, hey, from the training command, when they start flying to when they first fly in section and the stuff that they do in instruments, and then we build a section leader, then we build a division leader, then we build a strike leader. And so they figured out we've got this continuum that takes you towards command and it was really ingenious on his part but top gun was the genesis of all that with we have this idea but the idea expanded and then ceos of destroyers are coming out to top gun to see me like okay i don't know what we do for a destroyer but it's a great idea well they want to do it in their community they want right? to do it in their community yeah. so, so navy wide it was fabulous yeah but let's so Right, so I'm Go trying ahead. to build the story here. So when Top Gun came about, it was because of poor performance in Vietnam. So exactly, the, the time, kill ratio was one to one. There you go. So the, the, the idea was we need to do something. Mm -hmm. And the solution they came up with, in an alternate universe, they could have come up with different solutions, but the solution they came up with, as you said earlier, let's take someone about midway through their first tour, a, a young lieutenant, maybe even Lieutenant JG, and they've had maybe a deployment, they've got experience, mm -hmm. they come, now we're going to give them very concentrated, and like you said, about you know short five-week training on here's what we, as a community, think is the best way to tackle a problem. Yeah. Oh, by the way, they had their chance to get their hands on some exploited aircraft and they, yeah. what's the best way to dogfight what's the best way to shoot a missile so that worked for a while but then it sounds to me like the power projection as it was called prior to 96 i believe where you take like the guy from the movie you take him out give him train send him back the problem was correct me if i'm wrong some squadron co's didn't want to send their best people some squadron co's didn't want to hear what they had to say when it got back and like you said you couldn't fail so it was great for when it started in 69, but by the mid 80s, all of a sudden, like, well, maybe that parallel universe solution could have been a better one because we're seeing these other issues. Exactly. Okay. So historically, though, if you look at it, you go, there was a thing called FEGU, Fleet Air Gunner Reunion. And that was, was in it? El Centro. With, there was a trailer at Miramar. <laughs> oh, that's a trailer. Was yeah, yeah, there were Miramar right. and there. Okay. And they would tow banners and they'd shoot at it, you know, and so there were guys like, a, a great guy, Dave Frost was part of the original group. So he always gave me all the stuff. So then we found that the missiles weren't very reliable. 
So they pointed that out. The kill ratio is low, but they pointed towards training as being the big deficiency. So they said, hey, let's get some focused training. Then we went to power projection. We had no control over who showed up. You know, bring your airplane, bring some guys that turn wrenches on it, and whoever it is. We actually had O5s going through the power projection course oh, sometimes. Oh, really? okay. Believe it or not, because they go, well, you know, I think I'll go because, you know, we had O5s going, XOs showing up. So we all knew that, hey, it can't be, you know, really the department heads are busy doing other stuff. The leadership's got other a lot of stuff to do, but it needs to be a solid junior officer. But to really do it correctly, the course had to be longer, which is then 1994. And I'll give you the I'll give you the guys that were the core of the architecture to it. Okay, there was a guy named Mike Barger, crusher, brilliant officer, pilot, tactician, smart guy. He ended up going with it. He and his brother kind of put Jet Blue together. Okay, oh. so uh, very successful guy. He teaches yeah. the University of Michigan now. He's got his doctoral degree. So smart dude, Lang Sias, who was actually a lawyer before he came to. Uh, Come Top Gun, which is okay. he sat in Newport at looking out the building at Miramar at, at, at Newport at El Toro and went, that looks cool, and I'm bored being a lawyer. That was his story. And then uh, Steve Foley, Axel, who was compadres with those characters. Then Rob Field was my XO. So Rob Field's like, you know, and he's one of the greatest pilots, brilliant guy, superb individual, you know, cool. If there was a guy like the ice that was cool, it was Rob Field. CEO of the Blue Angels and Air Wing Commander. That's the big double whammy that one could pull off in the Navy. Retired 06. So they put it together, and then my job was to pitch it. Okay? So I'll tell you, if you're ready for a little story that happens on a Friday afternoon, they go, okay, Skipper. Uh, you just showed up, right? I'd, I'd been there, yeah, not very long. I mean, you know, my my engraved name is just getting dried on my door. <laughs> I don't even have my models arranged in my office. And it's like Friday afternoon at five o'clock and ice comes in. Hey, Skipper. So, you know, you're going to Washington, D.C. on Monday to pitch this SFTI thing, Did SFWT. You know well, yeah, I knew that because they okay. had my airline ticket and stuff. I uh -huh. go, yeah, 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 I, I've, I've got it. And uh, have you had a chance to look at all the slides? Yeah, yeah, you know, I'm going to look at them over the weekend. You know, no problem. You know, I'm busy with my eight-inch inbox of stuff of just having taken over. And he goes, well, why don't you come down to one of the training rooms and let's go through it. And so you can kind of get it down. I said, oh, that's cool. You guys are sticking around. It's like 515. I thought you'd be over at the club. No, no, no. We'll go down. Axel's here too. And, and come on down. So I walk into the training room. There's 36 guys in there. The entire staff. <laughs> Little do I know, I'm going through a murder board. And attention on deck and go, wait a second. We don't need this many people here. Oh, no. This is how we do this it. This is how we do it. You know, and I was like, I'd never been to a murder board. <laughs> yeah. But I knew what they were. You know, so I was new to the squadron. I was like, wow. oh, my God. And they sat there. I went through, stumbled through, slide by slide. And they beat me up for the next hour plus. I said, isn't it time to get some beer and you know get to the club? No, you need when you do this, you're hesitating and you keep looking back. So it was like, okay, look, I promise I'll get this down. I'll be working on it all weekend. It's like it was my <laughs> trial by fire, and I was just another lieutenant at that point. And I said, okay, okay, I get it, I get it. Yeah. And you know what? It, as it went on, and I went around and visited, it got more polished and better along the way, and. Sure enough, it, you know, they really resisted it, the fleet squadrons did. So I went to each fleet squadron, each Commodore, and I, what I really needed was the Commodore to get behind me and go, okay, we're all here. Listen to what these guys are doing. And they call them Swifties. That was the, that was the call sign. Oh, it's the Swiftie program. You know, so guys were kind of giving us a hard time. So it's like, no, this is a good thing, and this is why. And so, uh, you know, it took a while to get going. Yeah. Some resistance. There's always resistance to change. Well, and it's easy to denigrate what you don't know. Yeah. It's threatening. Yeah. Right? And then I'm taking the guy for 10 weeks, and the Commodore is giving me assets. Not necessarily the squadron. If it worked out that way, but it would be a group, and they go, okay, we're going to share airplanes. But he'd go, you're giving it to him. So it was only as good as the Commodore was behind it. And so I had to go to Cecil and pitch it, and I went to 
Oceana with the fighter wing there, and I think Snort was in charge of it there. Uh-huh. So Snort was behind me. So it was like, yeah. hey guys, this is a good thing. We're getting behind it. So, so that's what I need. Yeah. So, but let's take a step back because okay. we identified some of the shortcomings with the first solution, which in itself was very effective, but wasn't perfect. So now we said, hey, you know what? The Air Force and the Marines, as I understand Brad's book, have these programs. Like you said earlier, it's a progression. It's cradle to grave. You take someone fresh out of flight school, so they are a winged naval aviator. But now, how do we make sure they get through the training? Because prior to that, as I understand, I wasn't there, but you tell me. A CO could run his or her squadron, I guess his squadron back then, however they wanted. So if you went from a Tomcat squadron here to a Tomcat squadron over there, they might do simple things like intercepts or BFM totally different. And now you have this group of experts, let's call the Top Gun Bros, who have looked at it, have looked at the threat, have had murder boards and discussions and talked to industry, and they said, hey, look, okay, yeah, that works, but we found this, this works, but this is what we think is the best, and you almost can't argue with results, because you get that, right? I'll get to a point here in a second. So now, well, okay, if we think this is the best solution, let's codify it, and let's make everybody go through it, because in the end, sure, COs should be free to do what they want with their squadrons to a point, but what we really want are effective warfighters. And so that's where, as I understand it, the Strike Fighter Weapons and Tactics Program, which creates strike fighter tactics instructors, SFTIs, if I get that right. SFTIs. Uh, and, but with that was this, hold on, we're doing just fine over here in VF I know, Humpty I France know. or VFA and that was, France. And that was the rub. Okay. It was, that was the break X, eh, wait <laughs> a second, now we yeah. know we're doing it worse. But, and that was really, you know, what I was faced with that dog took up after me to say, you know, to carry the mantle for, mm-hmm. It's got to change, and this is going to change. And again, when the leadership got behind it, and then other places started embracing it, it's like, this is a really good thing. Now, we got a more seasoned guy. You got to remember that. Or, And we never trained a woman, and I know some women have gone through it, because when I was in the Navy, we didn't have women in the fighter squadrons. They were just starting. So come 99, it it was all relatively new. So when those individuals came to us, they'd have a thousand hours quite often. So we got a more seasoned F-18 or F-14 person, you know, pilot or crew into the course. And, uh, you know, that was way better. That was going to shore duty. So there's the difference. It wasn't somebody that you'd only get one more cruise out of the under the power projection five week deal, but the 10 week thing changed it. And the other part of it became if we didn't like their performance, and I had to become the first guy, Skipper, uh, yeah. we got to talk to you. So I was always, and I always knew when the training officer would come down with the XO, you know, it was probably going to be something serious. And we need to, and unfortunately, we had, I had to send a guy home. So when you. And were... I remember it was only being one. Oh, but good. now the who went, you know, the, the, who went into it? Yeah, Not, yeah. oh, you limp him along, and okay, he's, he's got a couple, you know, I, I got a lot of those turns wrong down too, but it was like, no, he's not getting it, and we've, we're have we giving him a refly here and here and here, still not happening, and then I have this tough conversation with the Commodore, usually. Because they've invested in the invested CO Invested in yeah. the CO first, but the Commodore would always be part of it because that guy had, they, that, that person had orders to the weapons school. Now it's... Now it's all changed because you're going, you're not going to wear a patch. Right. So that was a little difficult. And I can remember that being either one or two people that I had to do that to. I can remember one in particular. It was hard. But pretty rare, it sounds like. And Very the point, rare. The point you made a moment ago, right, is when you went through, you left your squadron for five weeks, went on yeah. TAD, what you yeah, call it, yeah, right? yeah. and went back to that squadron. Yeah. When I went through in 2000, I left VFA 86. I knew already that I was going through and staying on the staff. And in that case, I yeah, had two totally deployments different. under yeah. my... I was really yeah. close to You're a thousand hours. seasoned yeah. aviator. Okay. You'd been in combat. It's like, oh, Jello knows his stuff. I still He's struggled got a thousand through hours. the course. Huh? I still struggled through the course. So <laughs> I was, now, uh, now, let me say, let me do this. I had to go through the class. And I go, wait a second now. You know, I got more hours than any of you. And so in the F-18. So now they go, no, Skipper. Uh, but you went through as a CO? Oh, yeah, as a CO. <laughs> I had to go through 1v1 and some uh, other stuff okay. to be, quote, a wingman. You know, okay, put me in the back. I'm going to get shot. It'll be over with, you know. And so, which is, and there's a story about the Black Hornet, too. So anyhow, uh, 
So I say, and, uh, so they go, okay, this one v one, and I just, you know, I wouldn't get my little curves right. And I'm sitting there going, I got about a million things to do in my office, and I'm, we're gonna let's just go out and fight. There'll be about three or four things, and and I thought to myself, you know, self, you're pretty good at this shit. I have, I had, I as, uh, let me think, when I was a CEO, I was with the Red Patch. I was at two thousand hours, and you'd flown nonstop, probably. Oh yeah, I'd been that. flowing my rear off. Yeah, yeah. We flew 40, 50 hours a month since I was lieutenant. So I come in there going, I, I, I heard the XO go, give me the best guy. I want to fight the best guy. And they go, you sure? I go, yeah. I say, who is it? And they go, it's Badger. And I go, well, call sign like Badger. You go, this guy's going to be like a wild animal or something. A Marine built like this. There are two guys that are really good. I want you, you need to fight Badger. I go, okay, schedule me with him. We went out, and I mean to tell you, I'll never forget this. And I go, I know when I'm going vertical, I know how I'm going to force him up, this and that. And I felt like I really knew how to drive the F-18. What airplanes were you in? Uh, F-18As. So both of you then? Yeah, both okay. A models. Old so lot, the difference is? Oh, lot A. There was no difference. The, lot yeah, A Hornets. No, the difference is the, no, the, the stick actually. The nut behind the wheel. Exactly. Yeah. So I, got, so I get there. I meet him. Boom. Right. Like I normally do this and that. And he says, and he starts to do the, you know, a move on me and he goes, and he's telling me what I'm doing in my airplane. And I go, he goes, this is what your speed is. He was within five knots of telling me what he thought my speed was and when he was going to force me to start back down or not. And I was like, and he was just that good. I mean, he, he beat me up in all three engagements. <laughs> he might have had six or 700 hours of the Hornet. I just so, I was so humble, but I thought, I, I realized at that point, these guys are that good. And so... I then realized, you know, I'm not, there's, there are going to be some things, maybe they learn leadership wise, but I'm here to facilitate the success of the unit and pitch their program. And at that point, it was like, you know what, I'll just be in the back and become a pin cushion <laughs> on some of these deals. Yeah, yeah. And, and they even brought down, there was, a, there was another guy that was a CAG later on. And I, I'm trying to think, of, you know, George Dom. Oh, yeah. See all the blues. Yeah. So they snuck George in to fight me in the unknown one v ones, and and he yeah, had a brand him. new uh, EPE engine Hornet. But by that point, I was think I think I held pretty well against old George, <laughs> and we went home cool. together. And I was like, and I was like, okay, now who are you? In the other airplane, he goes, it's Elwood. <laughs> and I go, okay, let's go back to Miramar. Also a very successful after the name. Oh yeah, he's a, big surprise. Yeah, he's he's done very well. All right, so Trotz, earlier we compared <laughs> since you had experience in both mm -hmm. the Tomcat and the Hornet. Now you had experience in both in the power projection and the SFWT. What did you see from your point of view of the advantages and disadvantages of either? Because from my point of view, I think of the first thing that we came up with as oh, it was good enough, but now we fixed it. But is that true? I mean, maybe that's a faulty assumption. Maybe there were some advantages now, to the old when way. We, you know when I thought that we really, you know, it was like the harvest ha finally happened when I was a keg. And then we'd get those guys what back. What year was that? That was uh, six years later. So 2000-ish? So 94 to 96, I'm at mm -hmm. Top Gun, about 98. So it's like four years later, okay. I start seeing these guys seated. And, we, and it's like, oh, we want him. Or we want... We want that person because they're Top Gun guys coming back to the fleet. Mm -hmm. Now, there was an issue with you know that old term green main, and a lot of those guys didn't know what that term was Agreement for a long time. You remain. know what a green main was? Okay, they had to go back to the fleet, so that put pressure on. There were two things: we're moving to Fallon, okay, you're not at Miramar anymore, and we're putting on a commitment that follows Top Gun. Now, a lot of my instructors, in fact, the vast majority didn't have a green main, and so they could get out after Top Gun. So it was sad that we lose that talent to the airlines because we had some really super people yeah. that we didn't keep, which was a shame. But again, then they, they had their choice. But uh, after that, it became, I don't know that I want to be a Top Gun guy and go back to the wing because I won't be able to get out of the Navy. So we had that kind of... You know, there was resistance I bet. to coming to Top Gun, and we're going to Fallon. It's a great place. Was that coincidental, <laughs> or was that connected with the SFWT and the SFTI? Because it was about the same time, right? The move was in 96? Yeah, that was deliberate. And that was but it. not related to SFWT, I don't think, right? Wasn't it had, had if to do you with... you went through, I believe that if you went through, you needed like a keg strike ops tour that followed your tour 
with the weapon school. So I think that it was sort of like, we're sending you a Top Gun. You're at the end of your tour with a squadron. You're going to Top Gun. Then you're going to a weapons thing to follow or Top Gun itself. And so the Navy is like, we want, we want a, a, a chunk out of you. You know, we, we need something back. Right. So, I'm not. I'm not talking about the Green Man. I'm talking about the move from Miramar to Fallon. Very end of '96. Right. The, I went up to look at the buildings, and then Dog did change command at Miramar. He moved them up. Why? Was it Why? because? Right, well, it was just was, all it, was it BRAC or was oh, it SFWT? BRAC did everything. So it had nothing to do with SFWT. It just so uh, happened. No, both no, those no, things. no. It was. It was no. It was a deliberate. It was a deliberate plan. Uh, within, I think it was it called N5. Do you remember N8, N5? It was the the, the head guy was always a three star admiral in the Pentagon. Opnav, you know. Op, that was like N98, but I whatever might be thinking it was, of something else. 88. So, in, in any event, that was the your top naval aviator in the Pentagon, and they went okay. All these, you know, there were there were uh, there was the whole move in, under John Lehman got gave up a ship and then we built the Fallon ranges and Fallon got bigger and bigger. It made sense. And so then it was Brack, I'll never forget playing playing golf with my three star boss at Air Pack. And he was like, he goes, Now why are we giving this up? I go, You're in charge of Air Pack. I don't know. Yeah. You know why why are why are the guys at El Toro, you know, going coming here and taking it over? You know, so no one knew. There was a lot of it was political. Okay. Very, very political as to which bases in California got closed? George got closed. Uh, El Toro got closed. A whole bunch of them. So they realigned everything. Oh, okay. E twos are going here. These right. groups are going there. And then these helicopters are all coming to Miramar. They put like a billion dollars into the infrastructure at Miramar and said, "See you later. Thanks Thank for the you. hangar." Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so we moved to Fallon, but it was all laid out years in advance. With this is how we're going to save money. And I think it was during the Clinton administration of downsizing the military and closing up bases around the country. And honestly, who knows, you know, what made sense to anyone? Because right. a lot of it was like, oh, wow, how'd we give that up? I, but so I, did the Air Force. Right. I was just wondering if, and I think you answered it, but in other words, it wasn't that somebody said, hey, we're going from power projection to SFWT. We're going to make SFTIs. And we can't do that in Miramar. Well, we have to do that in fact. You know what? It brought us closer to our one of our core missions, Dropping bombs mm. and strike. Otherwise, you had to go to Fallon. Yeah, or Yuma then you go to Fallon. And then you're not. Then you're not refining those skills. So I think in in the in the long run, the Fallon ranges, you know, are unrivaled, just like the ones down at Nellis. Yeah. So those two are the gems of DoD for air power, and so you go, hey, what? you're not striking anything other than shoba down at san clemente and it's not a great target so it really made sense to say hey we're going to do these these big strikes and this is where we'll be and we'll integrate you into strike strike you okay right. so then we became it was nsoc nsw you know so i couldn't yeah, keep track of all of it yep. but there'll be an admiral there so that was all the whole the whole new alignment and then we would be beneath it was dave nichols tim keating was was uh very much part of that architecture and the in the and the thought processes, he, which, and these guys, these these guys were smart dudes. Yeah. I don't know if you ever knew Nickel, Dave Nichols. I did. He was it, he was the admiral there when I was yeah, leaving. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so he and I worked together as to how would we go. My biggest issue with going to Fallon was control of our assets, and I just said, and that was the th one thing I passed the dog. I said, we've got to control our airplanes. We can't just say, hey, let's you know, I'm sorry to say it, but you know, to say let's just anybody can fly these F-18s. And you go, no, we need to, we need them for our class. We need to control them. So losing that command spot I saw was really critical. And now you're a department head under NSOC or whatever, you know, I yeah. don't know the names, NOC, NSOC. Nautic. Nautic. Yeah. yeah. Oh. And so, yeah, I, I, I was long gone. Yeah, and well. so, you know, it was like, uh, we got to control our planes. These are our assets. And we were in Echelon 2, actually Echelon 3 under Air Pack. So when I needed something... My boss was three star. He go, we need this, mm -hmm. and we had a real problem with maintenance when I first got there. Our jets were horrible. We gave up the F-16s, 16 of them, flew them away. They were in perfect condition. Mm -hmm. They all went to the desert or to museums. You'll see one in Pensacola, uh, and then they go, oh, you got all these Lot Eight old Hornets, and the XO comes to me, says, Skipper, these things are departing flight all the time. They're dangerous, so. 
what we found was that the contractors that were working on the airplanes didn't have very good knowledge. So we brought in a really smart Canadian guy that was a test pilot, and the rigging was wrong on the leading edge flaps on most of them. They were way off. So guys were departing flight all the time, which is unusual in a Hornet. And so we got them all tightened up. We actually ended up firing them, you know, one of the biggest contractors on the planet, oh, wow. put it up for bid, got a new contractor in, and then kept the course going. So that was our biggest challenge in the whole time I was there. But if you were in Miramar, where yes. the squadrons were, right, yes. except for the F-18s, yeah. theoretically, and I, I thought I read this in Brad's book, oh, we got a problem with this airplane, we'll just tow you over another one, and you can still make the course happen. But No, the airplanes came from, the F-18s came from... Right, they came from Lemoore, but Cecil for a Tomcat. Lemoore, yeah. the Tomcats were, you know, yeah, they were there, uh, you know, right, right at Miramar. But, By the time uh, you got to Fallon, they, now things have to come in specifically oh, for yeah. the course. Fallon really exacerbated all that, yeah, yeah. and I wasn't there. We changed command at, at Miramar. Goodbye, good luck. <laughs> Goodbye, good luck. And then it's like the families all have to move, yeah. and it's, uh, it was it was it was hard. The gears weren't exactly and, meshing. I don't. And think. you said earlier it was somewhat difficult to get people to come to Top Gun, not only because of the work ethic, which is both hard but also amazingly rewarding, but also. Now we have these green mains and these other things. Well, that might be okay if it's in Miramar. But when it moved up to Fallon, again, I know you left, but that had to exasperate that okay, problem. Okay, it got hard with green mains okay. at Miramar. A little bit harder. Because what we found there was inconsistency with orders. Like one guy would have it, somebody else didn't have it. Oh, wow. Okay, then we go, we're moving to Fallon. And it was like, I don't want to go to Fallon. Yeah. Or I'm done after this. And, you know, there were quite a few of them that got out. And... It was like, man, the Fallon thing. Like I said, I always talked to Dog. I said, this is gonna be tough, man. You know, and he's, he was did an eloquent job at getting him up there and getting it going. But it was a tough road to hoe. Yeah. And so uh, it wasn't hard getting somebody to come to Miramar. We were real choosy with, you know, who do we want to become an instructor? And then we'd have this discussion, and it was like, okay, let's ask this guy. I don't remember anybody ever turning us down because it was not many of the staff each year that would turn over. It'd be four to six people. It wasn't that many. So I was like, yeah, I want to, oh man, that's an honor. I want to be at, at Miramar. Now you're not flying F-16s anymore. F-16s were a nice draw. Miramar, F-16s, and the previous course were all made it pretty easy for all my predecessor Tomcat buddies. You that know. must have been the heyday. Speaking of that, I might have misunderstood you earlier. Go ahead. Um, there was a pilot whose call sign was Nickel who wrote an article about flying the F-16N. Is that who you meant? No, Dave Nichols. Dave, oh, you A6 say, guy. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Sorry, I'm yeah. having a moment. So I have I have some listener questions. These are from Patreon supporters, and it has to do with the move up to Miramar. So let me ask you one of these. What were the advantages moving Top Gun to Fallon over Miramar, Stephen Lee asks? Any disadvantages or aspects of Miramar that was missed? I mean, obviously... We just talked Diego, to it. It's like, I go, yeah. okay, you know, here's this desert environment mm -hmm. that looks like a lot of the places we get deployed to. So now you've got real targets that are defended by adversaries right out of Fallon. So the training, way better, way more realistic. Right. The ranges giving you the feedback of where did the bombs land. And close. You know, and close. And it's close. Yeah, you're, you're right done. There, you're we roll right fuel, in there. Yep. The weather is pretty good up there, except in the winter. It can Once be tough. While. And so uh, it's, and you know, you go to Fallon, you're focused. It's not like, not like San Diego. You know, so the diversions, yeah. you know, all the fun stuff, you know, so when the when the Top Gun's up there or the air wing would go there, as you've done many times like me, you're very focused on the training oh, yeah. Yeah. and the and the ranges are fabulous. Not much else to do. Yes, we we no, fly. But I, I, well, I we was, drink yeah. beer at the bar. I was based there and my wife had uh, very good <laughs> relationships with other spouses because, like you said, there's Learn not to much ride to horses. Do. Come yeah, on. That's right. <laughs> so along those lines, Bethany Atchison says, uh, did the location change affect retention or cause broader morale issues with the members and their families? And I will just address that for me. Go ahead. Yeah, I, loved, I loved the tour. Yeah. It was the hardest I ever worked. I still call it my high water mark. I didn't screen for command, so that might have been a different situation. But I loved it. I took so much from it. But living in Fallon in the few hours for the, the guys doing the work, when you're not working, yeah, there's not a lot there. And the families had some struggle with it. And then when I was there was when they had all that leukemia stuff. You the remember water. That? The water. I thought, oh, I wonder if he's going to talk about the water or whatever they think. It, and there were a lot of children. Found, yeah. A lot of children with leukemia, which is like, Including oh someone whose name you dropped earlier. Um, so... But did you notice that? Did uh, as, again? You had left. Well, by them, here's but... the deal. You got to remember, I'm dealing with Miramar, 
for th two and a half years. Mm -hmm. And then I'm getting bits and pieces of, you know, what's about to happen when we go to Fallon. But I, my mission, my job was to try to make it as seamless as possible. Go up and look at the academic facilities, compare them to what we had. Go and look at the hangar and see how the hangar looks compared to the decrepit old hangar that we were in, you know? <laughs> so there were some good things. Yeah, yeah. And then the integration, because really the integration was going to be, you know, the most challenging, you know, with how do we fit with strike? Because it was strike you at that point. Right. So now we're all going to be under the same umbrella with an admiral. And and there there wasn't an admiral there for yeah. a long time. But you're giving up your freedom, right? You were. Oh, yeah. you, well, you were, yeah. You, uh, well, you you're giving up your officer. autonomy. You're giving up control. Right. And yeah, so, that's a good way to put you it. know, control for us was everything because sure. our adversary assets, we controlled. We controlled the quotas. We, we were, you know, we were literally our own bosses. Even when we went from an echelon two to echelon three, that was the first thing that happened when I became the CEO. We went under AirPAC. We weren't under AirPAC before. Mm -hmm. We reported to the CNO. Yeah. And so, which was, I think, N8 or N88 or whatever it was. But we then moved to having a three-star had this commander that was working for him. And I'll tell you what, having him, in this case, Rocky Spain, he was unbelievable. With I, It was one call. I'd say, I, I call chief of staff. It's like, I need to talk to the admiral, and he'd Whatever solve our problems, yeah. get some more F-18s down, get more of what they need. Yeah. And it was like, this is great. So it was really good having him as our boss. Then you say, okay, now you're going to go, now you're going to work for an 06, and you're going to be a department head. Right, you're sharing not, assets. I don't know if they wear ranges. a command pin or not. They don't. And, okay, so. It was a, still a big issue when I got there for years Are they even later. called skipper? I mean, yeah, we, well, because they're former CEOs. Former CEOs. So, yeah, yeah. we did so call it's them kind of a. Yeah, it was an interesting I bet. integration. I bet. I wasn't there, though. No, I, I got that. So, Michael, one more question in this Go line ahead. of events. Yeah. His is an interesting one you don't think of too often. D did uh, the training continue during the move, or did you take a pause from classes? And uh... I think that I would have to go back and ask Dog Thompson if they – I think they paused. and they, I would But think. they didn't miss too many beats. I think that there was a, okay, this many trucks and get your moves – Housing was an really? issue. Yeah. Well, you probably had some folks go early, some folks go later. Exactly. Yeah. And then who was making the move and who's oh, new? Because Yeah, because you go, mm -hmm. I'm not moving to Fallon, but I'll help them for a few weeks, TAD or whatever it is, and I'll live in the BOQ for a couple yeah. months while it gets going. So I really, I okay. never got into the weeds on that as to how, okay. how'd it go? Yeah, I got, yeah, yeah. I had it. You've got yeah, it. That's right. <laughs> I'm luck. off to other things. <laughs> so on that note, you said later, by the time four years later ish, you were an air wing commander. Yeah. You're starting to see the fruits of oh, the yeah, SFWT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But put some teeth to that. In what way? That that the maturity level of now these guys are now department heads. Okay, that are that are coming out of the weapons school. So you're talking about SFTI. SFTI coming, back, to coming back. Now mm -hmm. they're doing their strike ops tour. Or they're a department head in a squadron, depending on seniority. Right. And wow, did they know how to lead? So you could, when a when a Top Gun instructor or an SFT SFTI grad was there, it was like, those are our go-to guys within the air wing. They're going to help us with the planning process. Either. Sure. And you know, we it was still Operation Southern Watch. We're kind of back into Iraq and. Those, you know, the, the personnel that you would have to go, hey, we're, we're going to, and we had this one mission that I went into Riyadh for, and I said, okay, we're going to hit them, which is Iraq, the Southern Watch. We're going to hit 26 targets at one time, and it's going to be about 150 air aircraft, multi nation Goodness. strike on the place. And I'll tell you, the, the people I went to are, you know, these are my SFTIs, O4s. So, okay, let's plan this thing out. Yeah. And it was, it was 150 wow. aircraft between Air Force. I think the French did something, uh, the Brits, and I don't think there were any Germans there, but it was, yeah. Trotz, let me ask it was you the yeah. same question, but different. Go ahead. How did the SFWT program, or how did you see the benefits of that as an Air Wing commander, in so much as not those individuals you just mentioned, although that's awesome point, but what about a brand new person like maybe me shows up to the squadron, a nugget, and now instead of you've got one CO that wants to train me one way, had I gone yeah. to a different squadron, it would have been different. They now have, I'm going yeah, through. So what? by the time you're sending me somewhere, not necessarily as the Air Wing commander, but you see me leave, how, did you? Yeah, you see your document sitting over there, your binder? Mm -hmm. That's how it went. So to become a section leader, it was all laid out. To become a division leader, it was all laid out. And it was like, 
We used to have a thing called PQS, you know, the Navy. Yeah, so, right. you know, personal qualification standards. And that's what it was on a, on a continuum. And so they'd get all these things checked off. So everybody was talking the same talk. So the briefs were very standardized because that's the way that this is the way that Top Gun shows us how to brief. Right. But it was also strike. And so strike you when they integrated, it was like, this is how it flows. So they were very professional briefs, very timely. And then this the skill set of the people that were doing the planning was way beyond where we were when we were 03s and 04s. We go, where are we going? <laughs> you know, What are we planning out? <laughs> Be in the middle of the night, some yeah. contingency plan that was like, no, where the heck is that? Why yeah. are we doing this? Yeah. But we didn't, we just kind of threw stuff to the wall and sometimes it worked out. We flew a lot though too, but now there were standards. And so that's what you would see. And it was like, it, you know, the complaint that I always used to get as the air wing commander would be, this brief is too long. <laughs> I, go, I go, okay, look, we're here four hours in advance because it's a big, big strike. Let's talk about it. Uh, let's talk about it for yeah, a little bit. Yeah. And what's the threat? And how's the intel? But it was very well formatted with the flow of here's the intel, here's the weather. You know, it was very well integrated with mm -hmm. this is how we're going to go about doing it. And it was really kind of the same across every air wing. So you knew that if you went over the Teddy Roosevelt, and the East Coast Squadron air wings there, they're probably doing it the same way. And so that was what was really good. And there's value in that because oh, then you don't huge. have to figure out what they're doing yeah, and everybody yeah. could be standardized yeah. and effective. And I think at least I saw this a couple times. I had a squadron when I was the train officer having left Top Gun. We had an SH-60 uh, convert, basically. Call sign was Chopper. And yeah. he went through some of the SFWT because it was just the way that we all knew this is how you get smart incrementally. Mm -hmm. yep. You're going to start with these flights. You're going to study these things. When you're at the home station, you go to the simulator and you yep. can do these fancy weapons that otherwise you'd only read yeah, about. So you spun him up to get to a level faster than yeah. he would have been with, well, we'll just watch and see how we do things, which is kind of what, you know, what we did yesteryear was like, we flew a lot. And I, I had a commanding you officer. Hope it sinks in. I had this CO, you know, and he'd look he'd look at me and I look at him and go, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's like yeah. it was it was it was okay for us. You know, we were flying all sorts and we were very experienced. And he always would say it, he always go, Yeah, Trotter, you and I go out and you know, we go, we we <laughs> we fought these twenty eight guys yeah. and we never missed each other and that's but that was a whole different era in mm. a way. Yeah. Vietnam had its thing, mm -hmm. you know, Cold War had a kind of different mindset and methodology and and I think that, you know, the whole SFWT program brought us to, you know, another level of war fighting. Yeah, uh, uh, I think so. And yeah. in the case of Chopper, he was a super jail, we would call it, yeah. when I was the training officer. And then both of us went to VFA 94 yeah. as department heads. And uh, he ended up screening and I didn't. So he, yeah. he did pretty well. But, well, uh, you know, that's yeah. for other reasons besides just being tactical. But he, he ended up being very good in yeah. the F-18. And I think we can credit that program. And really, the smart people whose names you mentioned earlier who said, hey, this is awesome. We're way better than we were in the 19, late 1960s. But now we think we can make it even better. Yeah. And here's something. And again, according to Brad Elward's book, which I meant to bring, darn it. But uh, we'll have Kevin put uh, an image of it on the uh, screen. It's... Um, it, it was a deliberate, hey, what are these other uh, what are these other branches doing? The, the Marines had the WTI program. The Air Force had their WQT or something or other. So we, we kind of borrowed, but we also said, this is how we think we and can you know, do that, we, and they did. The, the other, as an aside, the relationship between the fighter weapons school at Nellis and Top Gun, so F-15 guys. It's funny because I ran into a guy the other day and I said, you ever know a guy named Kmart? He goes, Kmart? He was a three-star general. And I said, Kmart and I were, you know, both CEOs of, you know, he had the fighter weapon school for F-15 guys, and I had Top Gun. He'd come down, I'd go up, and there was this exchange. We had some Air Force uh, pilots that were so good, and they were so influential. One I'll mention is Lurch. He was brilliant. That was the guy that we set out and got him day-night qualified. It was like, we're getting him. He came back with Whoa, whoa, landing on the ship at night. I'm so proud of him, though. I was like, we need to get you that. It'll really, be, you'll see. This is really, this is what we do. Yeah, yeah. And he came back. He was, it's like, that's a big achievement for an F-15 guy, not to flare at the boat, you know. <laughs> so, well, he was very good, though. He was influential. Yeah. And I don't know if you ever use that, that, the post. Do they still use that term, the post? Because it was a term of, what are we talking about? With, in with, the BFM with, circle? In the BFM yeah. circles to say, yeah, 
He's the guy that was all from that, him. He, he came, came up, down. He goes, wow. okay, there's a thing called the post. That's where your turn radius yeah. is generated and the speeds and all. And was, then he explained it. And it was like, this is cool. This is good stuff. But it came from them. Yeah. But then we seeded them with, you know, some other things. And so uh, it was good. And we did certain things with other other four militaries that we had nice relationships yeah. with. That uh, Trots, if you haven't caught up to all my episodes, I know you're trying very hard. I'm trying. There's about 142 <laughs> I've got to go through. You know, it's like Start with 154. Are you familiar with the... Uh, precision landing mode, magic carpet. You know, I saw it and I, I thought, well, you know, sometimes I wake up middle of night and I need something to go to sleep with, but I don't want to do it You're then. <laughs> no, but I have gotten through about, yeah, you know, we just met. You I know. Know. So via bones, but I, that's when I go, now what is this magic carpet thing? You need thing? to listen. I got to see it. Because all these other lurch guys. Well, let me ask you this. How do they, how do they even have a landing competition? It's all F-18s. Well. So. And then it's all this magic stuff. So you well, know, now, doesn't everybody get a three know. wire every but, single time? Right. Well, the point I was trying to make, maybe not very well, is that I think you could take almost any pilot now and send them to the boat. It sounds so easy, but I've not done I'm it. I'm gonna tell you what. Yeah. I'm gonna anyway. tell you something that concerns me, though. What's that? I just went to the Naval Aviation Museum. I went down there, and you know, they they just I'm just some old dude hanging around, <laughs> looking at old airplanes. And I'll see these ensigns, and I know I know they're all stashed. They're waiting for flight school. Right. And so I, hey guys. Are you guys going to be Navy pilots? Oh, yes, sir. We are. Okay. So so, so what do you want to fly? Oh, I want to fly the P-8. Okay. Well, what? The P-8. Well, what is a P-8? Well, it's like a 737. Then you go right to the airlines. And I said, oh, that's the thing that replaced the P-3. Well, what about F-18s? Oh, no. They're gone all the time. So I, I, I have this vibe, and I kind of keep a little pulse on the Navy as to how are things going in the Navy. And uh, the real spinoff to the first Top Gun movie is you couldn't get in the Navy. Yeah. They turned down more good people than you'd imagine. I don't know what the second one's doing, but the whole my whole concern becomes, on a broader sense, DOD people that are motivated to serve this country and to be at the tip of that spear and go, you know, I can always go do the airline thing. I think that a long time ago that we made a mistake in making the commitment ten, like 10 years. And I said, it should have just been stayed at four. Then it, somebody comes in, well, I'll be out of the Navy by the time I'm like 25 or 26. But I think it's such a long commitment. And there's, I, I'm really concerned about the number of people that are coming in and what their motivations are to say, I want the easy life. Yeah. Because it's not an easy life being on the ship, but it's a rewarding I career wouldn't change it for serving anything. our yep. country. And I'll tell you what, I to this day, I'm so proud. And people say, hey, thanks. Now we say you're welcome. Yeah. Because I loved, I loved it all. You know, I, I was, wish I wish you to say this to the end. I would say, all right, we're out of here. Let's go. No, I mean, uh, well, anyway. But I have some more questions I need to throw out. No, you know, I'll get you to the airport, okay? okay? No, 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 I'm fine. All right. I'm fine. Uh, Michael Tennis says, "How difficult it was? How difficult was it to orient the instructors to the new task of the SFTI? How was resistance overcome? I think what you're going to say is there was none. They were trying to get you to so easy. Yeah. <laughs> no, they had. You know, I was not that I didn't resist. It's like that was my job, but I, you know, I I didn't know the quality of what was it, you know, expect of me. You, and you've done, you know, a guy, an instructor will only have one or two topics that he has to murder board. Some may have three. Uh, he's the SME in one three areas. Two parts, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the Sparrow missile, the Phoenix, you know, AMRAM or whatever right, it might right, be. Right. So they're the expert and the radar. Okay. You got to talk about this radar. <laughs> so, and that, the, you know, but the, I always say if anybody would ever sit through a Top Gun lecture, it's unbelievable the polish they oh, yeah. know which slide's coming up. Oh, yeah. So it's incredible. So I had to raise my standards to meet the expectations and what I needed to deliver to pitch the program, to make it good. Um, and it was really, uh, of my three command tours, that was the hardest one. Why? And the reason is you got a lot of type A's and there are a lot of smart people there and they want to lead the squadron, mm -hmm. except you're the guy in charge. But I'll tell you what, I it was a challenging but rewarding uh, tour. No doubt. But wow, you had to just let these minds yeah. go. And it's sort of like what you see with the Kansas City Chiefs. They come up with all these goofy plays because they're all working <laughs> together and they're doing it really good. And yeah, so yeah. really, it's Top Guns is kind of the same thing. You go, okay, they've got an idea. Some of them were a little strange, you know, when somebody was getting married and they had some bachelor party things that they wanted to do. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. 
Because <laughs> I remember one of them had a they had a letter LOI that came out for the bachelor party. And I went, oh wait a second, They're, we're going to go to a foreign country for part of this. No, we're not. <laughs> We all know where that's going. Yeah, yeah. But to Michael's question, it wasn't the staff, the bros, right, as no. we call them, that you had to convince. It was the fleet. It was. It oh, the fleet was. From, the fleet was. They had yeah. their shields up. They were like, you know, oh yeah, right, pitchforks and yeah. All right, so gasoline. <laughs> Joe Kunzler wants to know: Did you ever have to discipline a student or maybe an instructor? If so, can you please tell us how the conversation went? That's what I love about asking my Patreon supporters because you get these questions that it's like that's actually an interesting question. Good question. You don't usually get yeah. Yeah. some of the time to cover these, but uh, so did you have any experiences you want to share? Let's see. In that regard, we we did. I you know I I did get you know with, you had to send a kid home for performance. You already talked yeah, yeah, about with a performance. That was the hardest one. Kid. That was a really difficult one. Yeah. Because that was like you and and that that person. Uh, yeah. It was tough. That was that was my hardest one there, and there were two hard days there. And we had a young man that committed suicide. That was one of our sailors, oh. and that oh. was really painful for me to say. The the command doesn't have many active duty people other than a few people load bombs right. and the staff. And then everybody else, the vast majority of people at Top Gun are civilians. No one understands that. The graphic artists, all the people turning wrenches, they all work for a contractor. So you're dealing with civilians. So uh, those were those were difficult, but um, yeah. Uh, instructors, you know what? They're strong personalities. You kind of roll with it. It's a little bit like, you know, getting your butt kicked by some guy that's got a fraction of the hours of you, but he's just they're just that good because this is what they go out and do. So, you know, I was, I was probably... Like, uh, who'd you say it was? Not Badger. What? Badger. Oh, it was Badger? Yeah, Badger Arnett. Oh, he works at my company, or I work at his, I should say. Yeah, he's at... He's, he's, at he's up there pretty Delta. high. Delta. Yeah, he's probably senior to. Uh, he's like <laughs> he's in charge too. of like everything now. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, he's, he, I flew yeah, with yeah, him once. So, yeah, he okay. and... Uh, I missed that part earlier. I think, I, think, uh, I think Axel was probably pretty good too. Okay. Yeah. Here's one from John Clark. What were the major changes to the training curriculum as the two-place uh, Tomcat was being replaced by the single-seat Hornets in terms of aircraft capabilities and pilot crew responsibilities? So you have to adapt the syllabus to the platform, I guess, but was there any major issues that you recall? I don't recall many. Um, I was in that unusual section that they said, let's mix them. And that was right. really a VX4 plan before it became VX9. Mm -hmm. And so, but I don't remember, you know, we'd pair Tomcats with Tomcats. Then if you had a mixed, it'd be a mixed division. We, the Hornets are here, the Tomcats Section are there. And, you know, we, we had those challenges too. When you talked about the two platforms, I go, okay, the Tomcats really fast coming out, but they don't want to be cruising in at 0.84 Mach, you know, into a strike for 400 miles. They go, oh, we got to back the speed down because that's not a good speed for us. So um, I don't remember okay. many issues with... Because we would, we would not do a division of Tomcats. We just wouldn't have that many. So it'd usually be two Tomcats, or they'd be in a different division of mixed F-18 Tomcat divisions gotcha. when we'd employ them. Yeah. Well, and I should tell John, you need to go get Brad's book because it's very exhaustive oh, on yeah. all of that stuff and kind of the syllabus and all. the way it changed yeah. and yeah. the Malibu conference and all that. All right, uh, Victor Jagasitz, what was the main perceived threat in those years? I guess we'll be talking early 90s. The Soviet Union had fallen. China still had not uh, rose. Uh, what were the threat aircraft and air defense systems? I would think probably MiG-29 was MiG-29, former Soviet Union stuff. Okay. And sort of still the same thing, oddly enough. Mm -hmm. You know, MiG-29, Su-27, the Foxbat. And you know MiG twenty five, so uh, that mix hasn't changed much. Yeah. You know you don't face many Mirage series airplanes, but they did sell several to the Middle Eastern mm -hmm. countries. So you know it's th th that same theater. And you know as you went into Afghanistan, that's sort of a surface to air threat most of the time. That was the same thing in Operation Southern Watch. We'd ingress and they would egress to their boundaries of you know those two latitudes that they had to be out of. And uh, Desert Storm, I was there for Desert Shield, and, uh, you know, they, they just never really engaged. And if they did, they just turned the wrong direction, which is kind of what happened with uh, Mark Fox yeah. and, uh, is it yeah. Mongo? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah Mongo was Mongo. on the show. Yeah, yeah. and he, might have, he was probably in one of your, the squatters, I think, that you were in. Perhaps. We were at Top Gun together. Yeah. So, so yeah. That, that 
those MiG 21s just boop, yeah, went the wrong way right, that yeah, day. Right space. Cost them. But in the early 90s, it was still, I would say, what, single digit SAMs, right? The double digit SAMs. Yeah, yeah S2s, so. twos, twos, threes, uh, fives. Fives were kind of strategic. Sevens, and a lot of AAA. Yep. A lot of AAA. So that's, nothing's changed there. Yep. Uh, Jevin wants to know, I think this is the same question. Back in 96, what were the most feared Russian and Chinese threat aircraft uh, in a 1v1 scenario? What, uh, okay. You know, Probably a start, fulcrum you if you met one. Stuff. SU-27 was, you know, this thing could go high, fast, and was maneuverable, but you'd never see them. So a lot of these places didn't have those, nor we'd face them. They yeah. just, the numbers were never there. Yep. Here's a question from Brad Elward. Brad! He wrote the book. Yeah. But he uh, apparently didn't get it. He's every... got to know the answers. <laughs> well, uh, hopefully it's not a setup. <laughs> How did the departure of the F-16s impact Top Gun's ability to replicate fourth-generation threats, and what did the school uh, do to offset that loss? Mm. We didn't really talk about the F-16. We and didn't. I'd love to almost do a whole episode. Oh, on my like gosh. This. They were there for four months. That must have been the ultimate painful. fighter Painful. Experience. No, it was painful because I said to the guys, well, are they reliable? Oh, Skipper, we fly them three and four times a day. They check the oil between and nothing ever breaks on it. And they and it, it, we go out, we go 800 knots, we go fast, we fight, you pull a lot of Gs, we come back, we recycle the airplane four times, they're awesome. All of them, I said, I'd come in and i go, okay, how many F-16s are up? All of them. Like, really? All of them are up. And we had one two-holer, as we'd call it. And uh, so you had a highly reliable airplane. Now you're given these old F-18s. And we had gotten rid of the A-4s and the F-5s at that stage. And we had, we had a Tomcat or two. So we had these old A-models. They were hardly ever up in camouflage. <laughs> so it was the only thing that was kind of dissimilar. Although now we're fighting an airplane that looks just like it. Yeah. So it was like, okay, let's make the camo so they kind of jump out. Then I had this brilliant idea of ma making one black. And that was the, the staff resisted that in a big way. And you'll, I have a picture that I sent to you of it. And then it, when it came time to go on a cross country, everybody was bothering me for that airplane. It's like, oh, but I, you know, okay, you want to go across country, but you specifically list which airplane double zero is what you want. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, but it, it was a beautiful plane. It showcased the unit nicely. We'd always put on a static display when AirPack would have something or Fidelity Investments would do something in our. They, they, they would, we, oh, we gave the hangar all, all the time. Huh. So we'd put these statics in there, and then they'd always invite us to come over. And the guys, you know, you, you got these, you got these cheap ass dudes, the, the single guys that they don't want to pay for any food. So they would go over, you know, and all wrap up, and they'd go over and, and you know, have in their, in their old flight suits. And uh, it's like, they loved it. It was like, and then whatever company was putting on, I was like, wow, real Top Gun instructors are here. Yeah, That's they're hungry, right. and they like to drink. <laughs> So I was, I was, yeah, go on over there. So I always put out, and they're like, okay, there's a party in the hangar, and you guys go over there, but be nice. Don't yeah. do, you know, represent us well. But Top Gun has been flying F-16s for the last, gosh, 20 years now. But, but they're A, a models. Exactly. Yeah. The F-16N, A's and B's, N was built specific, I, don't, I think, for that purpose. It was. I mean, they took the, the N model, they, took all they went to Key West. Yeah. I think some of them were at uh, VF-43 at Oceana, perhaps. The Key West guy, guys had them. The uh, uh, VF-45, I think it was called. About the Adversary Squadron. Adversary in uh -huh. Key West, and then the in Top Gun. Mm -hmm. But the majority of them were at Top Gun. And I think they only bought... It, there is a little story to that. They were Pakistan airplanes. That was the A's and B's. No. the Well, here's what happened. There, uh, We had an ally that uh, started down a path that they weren't too crazy about. It may have been Pakistan. It was all part of a, hey, we're going to stop this giving you these airplanes because uh, I think it was something to do with nuclear weapons yeah. or at least dabbling in that area. And it was like, boop, they put an embargo sort of on them and they just mm -hmm. sat and they go, well, where do they go? We'll give them a Top Gun, F-16Ns. And so it was this, I'm not certain it even had a gun in it because they do took not. the guns out. Yeah. So it was a very lightweight airplane, no pylons, it just goes so fast yeah. with the big engine. So yeah. it was just this fabulous airplane. Oh yeah, I, And so, look, look cool, cool paint scheme too. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call you out, Trots, and we can okay, put a dollar ahead. bet on it. But okay, I, I, I'm pretty sure that was the A's and B's because there was 28 of them made. They all went straight from the but they factory went to, to the Davis boneyard. Yep. And they and they sent zip -locked them. 14 to the Air Force, which they ended up shooting a lot mm -hmm. of them down, 14 to the Navy. And I thought the end, if I remember from that 
article from Nickel was specifically built for the Navy. It may said, have been. Hey, we want to show you what we I can do. But I think it might have been so, an FMS thing to, for military be. sales that went sideways. No and it was like, okay, yeah. let's give them the yeah. Navy. It was a, Good stuff. They got a hell of a deal on them, too. Yeah. They All right. didn't pay much per unit. So I don't know if we answered Brad's question. So you just made do with what you had once the F-16s went away? Yeah, you know, we tried to make the camo schemes look a certain way. Mm-hmm. And so it was just, yeah, it was messy. Cause, right. You know, but nothing could match the F-16N. I mean, certainly not no, a whole Not really. All right. Um, here's one by Sven Weber. I don't know about this one. I almost left it out, but we'll have a, we'll have a go at it. Um, he read that in the 80s, the first F-A-18 pilots were called fighter attack guys. Uh, the reader, or listener in this case, or viewer, uh, may make up that acronym for him or herself. Um, well, what's the acronym? Fighter attack guys. What would that be? I can't spell. So. <laughs> you can't spell. Um, but t- I have a show to think about. Fighter Toronto. attack guys. Okay. Uh, but in time, the strike fighter became the mainstream. Was that all in good fun, or was there resistance to changing the curriculum <laughs> and the end of the fighter pilot culture? And I think even when I got to the fleet in 96, Trots, there was still a pretty – I mean, we were friends with VF-101. Uh, they were great on the, on the air wing. But – there was a different ready room. What year was that? It was before 07 because they all went away in 07. Oh, yeah. No, I got there in 96. Okay, so 96. They were around a while. Tomcats. Yeah, there was. You know what? I think, though, by that time, it was like, okay, you know, we're all here together. And so uh, there was a period in the early 80s where we thought the airplane, like the, the program was going to get canceled. Oh, it has no legs. It can't do this. It can't F-18. do that. F-18. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So the A model was, uh, you know, at least... If you read Aviation Week a lot, was it on the chopping block or not? It was, you know, it was an airplane that was competing against the F-16, but wasn't done in time. So that's when the F-16 became so prolific with all these, you know, these foreign nations. But it had all sorts of problems at the beginning with that first F-100 engine. You know, people called it the lawn dart. Then when we come out, it's, oh, okay, you're not as good as the F-14. And it's, it's a, it was a, I think it was a bit of a brotherly rivalry. You know, what else are you going to? You know, what else do you have to do on the boat other than give each other a hard time and go to Folks of Follies and compete, you yeah. know, in, in your in your hook competition? So I think that the – but we always used to hear this, big F, little A, you know. Well, which one are you doing? You know, are you a strike airplane or are you, you know, are you yeah. not? Are big you, F meaning a lot of fighter. Like that's our A lot thing, of fighter, right? you know? yeah. Are, are a little you, A, a little yeah. attack. Are you a dessert topping or are you a floor wax? Which is it? You know, you remember that one? <laughs> No. Saturday Night Live. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> so it's like, okay, today we're a fighter. Huh? Tomorrow we're that. And I think after a while it was like, you know, they're pretty good bombers. Because it, as you know, I mean, it was a good right. system to bomb. Right. And then as we started getting precision weapons, it's like, okay, just drop it in that basket, you know, with the JDAMs. And that oh, was, yeah. we did a first, one of the first deployments with JDAMs and oh, wow. some Mavericks and that yeah. sort of thing. But, uh, yeah, it was a, a, just a, a change that was incremental. Mm-hmm. At first it was this, you know, a little more of a frat rub kind of deal and then it, later on it was like okay we're all in the same frat yeah. you know well so and all the tomcat squadrons ended up turning into super hornet squadrons yep. anyway exactly so. yeah so you know some of the classics vf-84 you know jolly rogers they got still the two seats mm-hmm. uh you know they became what 102 or 103 or something like that but they well, kept the, the skull and bones yeah the yeah skull and yeah, bones 84 whatever. went away when it mm-hmm. became some another somebody, squadron somebody else said this is too cool to let die it we're going to adapt it, it over was. here yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> i think dale snodgrass had a little bit of oh, that, that one too so oh, rest in peace yeah oh trots i feel like we could do this all day we could that's a problem but i gotta <laughs> yeah and i've got to get back to work at some point <laughs> but it's it's really been fun you know i it's um i like to stop and you know look backwards and some of the people, and you had a great saying, and when, you know, it's, you know, people always ask, do you miss it? And I said, you know, I don't miss long briefs and being on the ship and wearing 45 pounds of junk to go fly an airplane, but I miss the people. And I try to stay connected. You know, I've almost made it a point of each month going, okay, I'm going to reconnect with somebody else. Snort and I were going to go on this backcountry safari together. We were all signed up and Cynthia, and it was like, shit, this whole thing happened. So, I start always look for a chance to fly. And so I had my change of command at Top Gun. He was there. I go, this is really cool. The Commodore from the East Coast comes all the way to my change of command. And he took me to the boat. He was my LSO to go to the boat. Okay. But he was lieutenant. And he was like, yeah, trots. You know, you always look for a chance to fly, though. So he was there for a little while. We had a beer together. But, yeah. uh, you know, it's time to reflect on, you know, all the sacrifice, all the goodness of what naval aviation has done for this nation, way beyond 100 years now. 
And, you know, some of the ultimate sacrifices of, I, I can reflect on, you know, the call signs and Scooter and Mangler and, uh, geez, just Buck all Rich. these guys. He was your, he Lex, Lef yeah. Lex Lafon, yeah. you know, an incredible T.C. Bennett. And some of these happened, these are both captains that happened for their love of flying. They kept flying after they retired as O6s. And so it's, you know, it's, it, it makes you pause, you know, for the grace of God, I keep flying and I keep flying airplanes that I can pull a little G's with, which is really wonderful. But uh, this naval aviation is, it's a tough job, but boy, is it a rewarding one. And, you know, has it served this nation well for a hundred and some years since. So uh, yeah. it's incredible. Well, I, I thank you for your service. You've done a great job moderating. And I'm gonna tell you why I know that. Cause I read some of these reviews there is a group of people that are in the world's largest iron ore mine underground, and they always listen to your podcast. And I go, wow, these, are, these, are, these people have nothing to do with aviation, but they're down there and their boss says, this, hey, here's something great to listen to on their break or whatever it yeah. is. So this little episode is dedicated to all of the guys before us that have flown off the boat, the people that are currently serving and a bunch of people down in some mine that are enjoying what you do because you do a damn fine job. Well, on. I appreciate that. Thank yeah. you. As yeah. I told you on the drive over here, I've always tried to make the Fighter Pilot Podcast not the Jello show. It's yeah. not about me. It's about the subject. It's about my guest. It's about the topic. And you're right. I mean, you could get a little, frankly, misty-eyed or, or yeah. nostalgic thinking about as much as I, I hated being on deployment. I loved being on deployment I know. because there's you're, ne you're never gonna have that experience again. I don't in the airlines. I don't even on this podcast. Although I get close. I mean, we just yeah. you know yeah. chatted for how long it's been, and and I feel like it's in a, a ready room somewhere or in a O club. But uh, I think that's part of the reason I do it is just to try to stay connected to this thing that was so special. Yeah, it's it really it's was. a brotherhood. Yeah, it's just you know it's it's a you know and now women are part of it. Sure, but it's a you know, naval aviation team yeah. that's, it's so unique and the lifestyle is tough. It's tough because the living on the boat hasn't changed a whole lot. Yeah. It hasn't, well, I think it hasn't become the Hilton, I don't think quite no, yet. But they have the internet, I, I guess. Oh, they have internet, I that's think. right. And they've got, they've got some, so. yeah, you know, Dan Long, Dan right. Link, something. Other. Well, so, again, another great ending, but I'm not done. Two more questions. What's okay. the future hold? You're still flying as long as they'll let you have a class <laughs> two or three or one? Fog a mirror and <laughs> have a pulse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I fly, uh, in fact, in my current job with our company, I've flown nine different air types of aircraft. We have a couple Gulf Streams. I had a chance to fly the big one the other day, and it had a HUD. So I immediately threw the HUD down and go, watch how you do this. <laughs> you know, so it's like, this, you'll become a HUD cripple if you look through this enough. Uh, so I've, I've flown the Gulf Streams. I fly a thing called a PC-9, which is very similar to the T-6 Texan II. You sent me a picture. It looks just like it. It's just like it. Yeah. The Swiss made it. I fly another Swiss airplane, the PC-12 NGX. So I'm flying uh, turboprops. I fly a Husky. We, go, we went on a backcountry safari thing. Did some stuff that I never imagined I would have done down, you know, in... A riverbed, landing on the riverbed, in the you know on a bank, and then you cannot go fishing and stuff. And it's mm. like there's a hot spring here. Okay, we'll go there. Yeah. And of course, it's a guy. It's a Doc Sugden. Rich Sugden's the guy that heads it all up. Uh, Harrison Ford used to come along pretty often, but oh. uh, you know it's a great group of people, and we all go together. So I go do that. So I kind of have this second lease on life by virtue of this wonderful employer that I've got, and uh, we have a lot of fun uh, flying between Alpine, Wyoming and Miami and all the world. And, you know, right now it's a, we're out in Vegas for a little bit. And uh, so life's good. Because yeah, I'm, like I'm well beyond uh, being able to fly with a guy like you at Delta, because they would have <laughs> said, no, you're two and a half years ago, you had to retire. Uh, okay. So it's, uh, it's yeah. great. I get a chance to fly Chase D. Conger around a little bit. Yeah. And uh, yeah, life's, life's great. I go between uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, right near there, and Miami, and I live in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. And my wife, who I adore and love immensely, supports my craziness of flying. And, but I tried my to bring gears her were just turning. I was about to mention her for oh, she's you. Amazing. You didn't, but she's I'm, amazing. She's amazing. And she's flown with me in just about all of our airplanes. Well, so. we, you and I talked on the phone, like, what, three nights ago? Yeah. And I did, I thought you were local for some reason. Right? <laughs> local, but as yeah. you tell me the story, your wife's in the background like, just cash just in go. your boat. Just go out there what for the day. What are you thinking? So you, I picked you up yeah. at San Diego. I'm going to yeah, drop you off when yeah, we're we're done. here for a couple hours. If you have time, I'll buy you a bite to eat first. Well, yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So, one all right. Bite, one well, last question. Go ahead. Tom Trotter, Trots. Doesn't sound that imaginative. <laughs> Maybe there's... Okay. 
here's about how imaginative it is. Aiello sounds like jello. Okay, you go, wow, that's boring. Okay. I'm spineless. Trotter though. trots. Nothing to it. So I did my dog bit me right before the only my missile shoot, because you had to shoot a missile at VF one oh one. So my dog bit that crap out of my finger. So my trigger finger. And so I went out and it was my turn. I roll in behind this drone. I fire off my missile. Nothing comes off because my finger was cut so badly I didn't pull the trigger hard enough. So I thought the trigger would have stuck, but it didn't. So it's like, that would have been a cool That's call too sign. Cool, yeah. Now what you find is that when a guy becomes an 06, then he becomes, you know, I'll, I won't, Chip Miller was always bullet, but Chip, you, you know, has a cool call sign. So I said, well, Certainly, you know, when I become the keg, you know, <laughs> you can become bullet or, uh, you know, you might be eagle or something cool. But that never stuck. It was just kind of always your keg, which is, mm -hmm. which is a great call sign. But I had this, I had it, this is the last one little story I've got to tell. Because only four people call me by this call sign, but it keeps coming up. After all these years, it comes up every so often. So I've got a brief with this Marine Corps captain. I am the same rank as this guy. I probably have more flight hours than him in the F-18 when I transition out of Tomcats. I've already been an instructor, you know, at the same level as him. We're doing a night round robin. So he walks in and he goes, okay, we're doing this round robin and uh, let's see if you're prepared. Where's your jet card? Now that's what you do in the training command. I said, I do a jet card. And he goes, what do you mean you didn't do a jet card? I said, well, I didn't do a jet card. You know, we're... <laughs> It's pretty simple. I've got all the coordinates all written down here. This is where we're going. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, how do you know you got enough fuel? I said, why would they send us out for this thing if we didn't have enough fuel? We do this every night, this little round robin thing. I can't believe it. You don't have a jet card. And so he was just, he got <laughs> madder and madder. It was like, look, dude, we're the same rank, you know, come on. And it was like, nobody does a jet card by the time they've been in the Navy for six years. And so he's, he's fuming. And he, he goes out to the right. He goes, you're going to do a jet card. By God, we're not going. And I was like, I'll give you a down. And I go, oh, my God. Where are the jet cards? So I go get a jet card. So <laughs> you probably remember who Bill Gortney was. Uh, <laughs> Shortney's one of these guys who yep. loves Shortney, Roger Welch, Dog. All these guys are in the ready room because we're all, you know, we're all students going through. And they, the guy walks in there. And he goes, who's this guy? They didn't have a jet card. Who's that guy on the, he's, and they said, oh, that's Tr Trotter's his name, Topper. And he goes, who's that Topper guy? And then, so he took my last name and he changed it around from Trotter to Topper. Topper guy, this Topper guy. And he just, all he did was fume <laughs> and get more spun up in the ready room. And I'm in there putting a bullshit jet card together. I said, here, hope that makes you happy. And <laughs> so he was like, I'm not going to talk to you. And so we get in the plane, oh, and he's not saying a word. Yeah. And it's like, so I started up. We, You know, of course, I got 1,500 hours. I didn't give a shit if he didn't talk to me. That was fine. And so we're in this two-seated F-18. We, the, we do the route. By the time I get to the extreme part of the route, my hydraulics go out on one side. And it's like, and he just sits back like, I don't like you, and you didn't do a jet car, and I'm not going to help you. And so it's like, oh, wow. you're the IP, hide one A and one B or whatever it was, we're going. And so I'm going, no, I got to go back and take it. I got to take an arrested landing. Blow the gear and down, I, probably. I have to blow the gear. I've got to get my book out and I got to call the STO and I'm doing all this stuff. And he just sat back there. I mean, to tell you, when we, we trapped and this thing had hydraulic fluid going all over the place, it took every bit of restraint to not punch him out as we got out of the airplane on the runway. I was like, you were worthless helping me through an emergency. Well, you didn't have a jet card, you think? <laughs> <laughs> so we come up in the ready room, and it was like the two of us are like, I was ready to strangle him. He was ready to do the same to me. Yeah. And he said, this topper guy. And so forever after that point, between those four guys, topper guy, topper guy. Yeah. And Tom, Doug, Doug Thompson says it the funniest, topper guy. Roger Welch, the same thing. So I'm, I'm going across country. Five or six years later, you know, I'm over the panhandle of Texas. It's like midnight and I'm going somewhere and I check onto some frequency. You know, this is fist zero three checking on flight level four one zero. Topper guy. <laughs> Go. It's one of those four that's going the other way in an F-18. <laughs> so 
there's Topper Guy. Uh, you know? And then that movie comes out with Topper Harley. If you remember right. Charlie yeah. Sheen with, uh, what was it called? That Hot funny, Shots. Hot Shots, yeah. yeah. Part two. Part two? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So there's a call sign story. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Topper Guy. I'll so, probably start yeah. hearing about it again now yeah, that we've well, now that I played like it out a, there. Yeah, it's like a uh, like a Fight Club type call sign. Yeah, it was it's in, only for it was in the vault though for a yeah, while. You yeah, know? yeah. <laughs> awesome. Oh man, well Trots, this was everything I expected it to well, be. Yeah, uh, yeah. We didn't bash on Bones quite enough. No, no, we'll. Um, but, yeah, it's a, but we can. It's we can do that. He's yeah. an episode of himself. He was. He was. Well, he was kind enough to uh, let us use. He his, gave you the digs. The studio. Yeah. Well, you know, charges a little something, but that's all right. But, Flat on her back, out yeah. of airspeed and ideas. There you go. You know, so it was well, fun. This was great. Uh, you talked earlier about a list of people you call once in a while. I hope you'll add me to that list. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, you're on, well, you're on my speed dial, yeah. Well, oh, you don't, no, you're not a favorite yet. You'll bubble ah, up there, I'm right, sure, I as we so. start talking.